I asked my supporters on Patreon for ideas for a new series for the channel and they came up with three ideas that uh, I put to, the, to a poll for them. So we had games with the Spanish, games by Michal Tal, and some of my own games, though, with suggestions. So poll organised and I fully expected uh, Tal to be the winner, but no. The overwhelming winner was... So there we go. I've got to show some of my own games. That was the wrong result. Never mind. Here we go. Well, let me show you this one. And it is it ticks one of the boxes. It's uh, a Spanish, or a, a Rai Lopez, as we say in England. Um, and this was played in the GMA Open in Palma de Mallorca in 1989, yeah, a long time ago. So the Grandmaster Association Open, um, basically, you know, there were a series of tournaments, you could qualify for a grand final, and it worked out pretty well for me, this tournament, I have to say. This was round four, and I was on the stage, my game, on a demo board, no pressure. So I've got white... And I'm playing Dutch Grandmaster John van der Veel. In my wild youth, I used to play the King's Gambit, but I have to say the Spanish was the opening that I really enjoyed playing in my professional days. I always felt so comfortable on the white side of the Spanish. So it's a main line. And van der Veel, with this, castles kingside, basically signals that he might well play a martial gambit. So if I play c3, then black has the option to play d5 going into this so-called martial gambit, and so on. Uh, I've never been comfortable taking that pawn. Uh, usually I like to decline it, well, or not even get to that situation, play an anti-martial system with a4, or in this case, I played d4. Now, that can be taken, that's another story, but van der Veel goes into normal lines with d6. And now I protect him my d-pawn with c3, and we have another pretty standard variation. Um, I haven't played h3, so that gives black the opportunity to play g bishop g4. And this is the so-called Yates variation, named after Fred Yates who was one of the strongest English players in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, in the 1910s, 1920s. I've always liked playing this with white, actually. You can play bishop b3 here, but I generally I like to close the centre with d5. The knight hits the bishop. Now, you've got to keep that bishop. It doesn't look like much at the moment, but so often that Spanish bishop bursts to life later on in the game. And now it's important that black breaks down this pawn on d5, so c6, h3. Let's put the question to the bishop. And bishop c8 is the best move here. Uh, you can also take on f3, that's reasonable as well. One mistake here is to play bishop d7, mistake, because then white takes this pawn. And with this, well, you don't win material but you've got the two bishops. Doesn't look like much, but those bishops are so important. That is a clear advantage to white. <clears throat> Bishop h5, also not a good move. This is a very typical mistake in the Spanish. You take here, and now you chase that bishop down. You bring the knight over, and you're going to win that bishop for a knight. I do like my two bishops. I hope that's coming across... So I think the best move, the most reliable move, is to put the bishop back to c8. So now I've got to do something about that pawn I took. Now, you can play knight takes, but it's better to play queen c7 and take with the queen. And that knight is going to end up on c4. So I played knight f1. Now, this manoeuvre, if you, if you want to remember one thing about the Spanish, it's this manoeuvre. The knight on b1 finds a new home on g3. It protects e4, but also looks to get in on that f5 square. It's such an important manoeuvre in this opening. 
Rook e8, good move. It's going to bolster the center, and the bishop can drop back here. And a4, again, a really important move in the Spanish. That, Although I'm not threatening to win anything here, it's just a constant head headache for black that something might happen. It's always nice to, to play against that pawn on b5. So Vanderbilt decides to play g6. Don't have to play there. Um, it actually leaves these squares a bit weaker, but at least it cuts out that knight from f5. <clears throat> now, there are various ways you can play this. I decided to get rid of that knight straight away. You can play queen e2. I think I've probably played that before, actually. Queen e2 and bishop d3. But, well, in this game, I had the idea to drive that knight back straight away. So the position becomes a little bit more closed. But uh, I was keen to do this because I like this pawn chain. Because those pawns here take away the b6 and c5 squares from black's pieces. So uh, just cramps black a little bit. Also, uh, having advanced this pawn, it makes room for that bishop to come to b3. And that's when the Spanish bishop really comes to life. Now, van der Veel didn't want to sit there and wait. He played pawn to d5, breaking open the center, which you know, strategically is, I think, a pretty reasonable idea. If black doesn't do that, then it's hard to see where black is playing. And in an ideal world, uh, this will give black a very healthy kingside pawn majority. If black can stabilize um, and you know, get get a comfortable position, make sure the king is safe, then later on in the game, advancing the E and F pawns could be very strong. But organizing that is extremely difficult. And this was the kind of position that I was aiming for. So both sides bring their pieces out, rooks are connected, and king g7, getting the king off that diagonal. Remember that that's a long-term aim to advance this f-pawn. Rook d1. Now, if you feed this into the computer, it basically thinks that the position is about equal. But I think from a human point of view, I think this is far more difficult for black to play than white. And the reason I say that is because there are so many tricky tactics in the air. <clears throat> So, for example, there's potential pressure on the e pawn. You've got to watch out for this uh, battery on the long diagonal. Um, there's, you know, potential tactics here. Watch out for taking and bishop h6 check. And yeah, the king is just a little bit insecure. Just feels a much more comfortable position for for white to play than black. Um, the computer thinks that queen c7 is the best move. It looks slightly odd to bring the queen away from this. Um, and instead, I think van der Veel played a more natural move, and that's just withdrawing the knight. And that means that this knight is pinned because of the mate. So I can't consider knight export, of course. But I like this position for white now. I think, you know, white has some really nice options. The... the the computer likes queen c1, just sort of conquering squares on this diagonal, which I think, yeah, looks very reasonable. I was uh, playing more directly. Pawn to h4, this looked really nice to me, just to advance this h-pawn, to soften up black's king position, maybe even plant that pawn on h6. And black has this typical dilemma, what do you do about this? Do you, do you block with h5? Do you play h6? Or do you just ignore that pawn? Well, van der Veel decided just to support his e-pawn. Um, if h5, that leaves g5 a bit weaker, and the whole of the king side a bit weaker. Uh, queen c1 again looks pretty nice with the idea of maybe playing bishop h6. One could also play knight e4, rather like that. And if f6, queen a2 is a nice move. You know, it's another diagonal that's that's worth conquering. Just feels as though black's king is a bit insecure here. But 
uh, my opponent played f6, supporting the e-pawn, and I pushed on. So this really starts to soften up the position. Knight f8 protects these squares, looks reasonable to just support the king side. And now was the moment where I had a big decision to make. How far did I want to push things on the king side? Could just drop that pawn on h6. Okay, but well, where do you go from there? It wasn't clear to me. But I decided in the end I screwed up my courage and went for it with rook e4. Obviously, I'm swinging over to the king side. This is the idea. But once you do that, uh, dare I say it, the rooks are split. Um, and it's kind of the point of no return. You know, that rook could end up in trouble. And I could end up in trouble in the middle. But I decided this, this was worth it. But now it's getting very tactical. And we're both running short of time. It's all getting very scary. So he brings a knight over, packing the king side. I exchanged and rook g4. So yeah, that g6 pawn is looking a bit soft. And I've also got the opportunity to check on f5, maybe check on h5, depending on how black plays. So, you know, things were, things were looking pretty good, but still... Knight g5 blocked out that rook. And now it's getting very tricky. So got to watch out for that pin still. I took and he exchanged on d1 and recaptured on g5. So I still can't take those pawns. It's still mate on g2. And now that rook is, well, it doesn't look bad. But yeah, still, it's getting a little bit tricky now. I threw the knight into e4, which looks really nice, actually. And now <clears throat> I, I do have a chance to take here, having blocked the diagonal. But after bishop c8, well, this is the move that I had to calculate, of course. Um, and he played it. And this is when my heart leapt. Um, at this moment, so I'm on the stage. Now, this tournament, so the Grand Moss Association tournament, this organization was the, the brainchild of Gary Kasparov, among others. But he was in attendance at the tournament and he was walking around the stage at this moment. And here, you know, I glanced up and I, I could see Kasparov looking at my board as he was walked around. And I played knight takes pawn. And Vanderville took my rook. Of course, if knight takes queen, then bishop takes queen. And at this moment, in, so basically I'm sacrificing. And I could recapture here with some compensation, but instead I played queen d4. So now I'm a whole rook down. Now Kasparov was just turning away from the board and when I played queen d4 he kind of did a double take at my board I will never forget it <laughs> he's probably forgotten it but I remember it he did a double take when I played queen d4 and he kind of looked at me um, and then moved on I was very proud of queen d4 so I'm a rook down but all the tactics work knight takes queen threatened but the queen is also on this diagonal. Now, if the queen moves, then I've got knight f7 check and queen h8 mate. Now, this is an important move. Bishop f6, pinning. So knight takes queen isn't on, then bishop takes. But I've got a winning move here, and that's queen a7 check. So I get out of this pin and then I can take the queen. Rook e7 keeps going for black, but after this, I'm a pawn up. Well, this move is very nasty. So I'm targeting that pawn on a6, and well, basically this is this is a winning position. Um, if that bishop comes back, I've got, you know, the, the, the knight can come in to hit the bishop. Basically, once I take that pawn on a6, then that a pawn is a runner. 
So all this had to be calculated before before I played this, of course. Well, in fact, a long time. Well, basically, you know, around about when I played Rook G4. Knight E6 played. It's still not over. Hitting my queen. But that could be taken. Queen takes. Knight takes bishop check. And although I'm still the exchange down, I'm going to win material back. So if king F7, this leads to mate. And king h7 played knight f6, so I'm winning back material here. Now, uh, I just repeated the position a couple of times just to make sure that I'd crossed the time control at move 40, and then I took the rook. So he's going to recapture this knight, um, and then I'm a pawn up in a queen and pawn endgame. Hadn't quite led to mate, but it's good enough. And with this pawn here, that pawn on a6, permanently vulnerable, um, it's best if he takes back immediately, but instead he checked. And now this gives me an immediate opportunity to make progress, actually. c4. So with this, I can create a pass pawn, basically. Uh, this is, yeah, it, it's it's too dangerous for black now. Um, I'm breaking through. Queen f8. So I don't want to take uh, too quickly. Got to be careful of this and careful of a check on f4. So I just drop the king back. So he defended the pawn with queen f6. But now b5 just creates that pass pawn. So this makes life very very easy for white actually pawn takes pawn so I've got this wonderful pass pawn on a6 and all I need to do is make sure my king is securely protected uh, just you know I, I shouldn't I got to be careful of perpetual checks um, but once I solve that problem then everything is fine my king is secure there's one last trick here and that is, if I hang around in this position, there's a stalemate trick. If, okay, let's play queen d3, then queen takes a6. If I take the queen, then it's stalemate. So I've just got to avoid that, basically. But I can do that by checking. And then queen b7. So the king is now on h6, not h5. If he takes, if he takes the pawn, I take with check. That's the difference. And here he resigned. There really is... No defense, and the queen is in the perfect position on this diagonal. So basically, he can give a check, but you, you'll notice the king is perfectly protected here, and then the pawn rolls home. Well, I was very proud of that game. You know, I really like the attack. I like the, the, the tactics in the middle, and yeah, there was the Kasparov moment, which helped. And yeah, smooth technique at the end. One of my favorite games. I hope you enjoyed it.